right. So oh, sorry. Recording. You're going for the record. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, we go. All right, uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. And uh, my guest today is James Jenkins. James is a longtime friend of mine. He's the principal tuba in the Jacksonville Symphony. And he teaches at the University of North Florida. And he's a frequent sub with the Cleveland Orchestra, the Boston Symphony, and many other places around the country. And he is the founder of a, a thing we're going to talk about later called Body and Soul, which is a very interesting topic. And he's a frequent sub with the and, Cleveland Orchestra, the Boston Symphony. And he's a technical difficulty. He is the Get founder it? of a thing we're going to talk about later. Hang on. James, you still there? Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm here. All right, I'm here. I, I see you and hear you. Yeah. I had to. I had to mute myself on Facebook because it's now. So, anyway, uh, so James, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your beginnings, man. When you were, um, you grew up in Miami. Your father was a chaplain for the Dolphins. Kind of a yeah. interesting, interesting upbringing, right? So. Can you kind of talk about that? Just even even prior pre tuba stuff, because I always found that kind of interesting. Okay. When you and I are playing orchestra, talking about that. Yeah. So I grew up in Miami, uh, an area in Miami called Liberty City. It was like the inner city, and I'm I'm a PK. You know, I'm a preacher's kid. So my dad was a pastor of a large church, and he happened to be the chaplain um, for the Miami Dolphins for a number of years. It, it turns out that he and Joe Robbie, who were the, who was the owner of the Dolphins at the time, were good friends and they did a lot of business together. So the way it, um, the way it manifested itself for me is that from time to time on Sundays, I'd look up and there would be Paul Warfield in church, in our church, or Mercury Morris, or Larry Little, and these, all of these like absolutely fantastic um, hero figures for me. But yeah, they would come to our church or get involved in things in the community that we would be involved in. And uh, yeah, it was fantastic, fantastic, including like the famous 72 undefeated Miami Dolphins season. Yeah, we, you know, I, I was there watching as many as the games of the games as they, they would let me watch. So and that was all because of my dad's connection. Wow. That's I always just found that fascinating. And, and one thing I meant to ask you about, uh, because you're such an understated guy, like uh, <laughs> It's, it's, oh, somebody's laughing. Somebody's laughing. Oh, you know. <laughs> Is that Joyce? That's Dr. Davis laughing, I think. <laughs> I, well, because, sorry, Joyce, I'll mute you for just a second, but because, uh, did you. Oh, sorry, no. Okay, that's okay. It's all right. Did you, uh, did you play football in college, James? Yeah, I walked on out there. I, I tried to get out there and, and play a little bit, you know, yeah. so. That's not much of a story, but yeah, we were well, out there. I remember there. asking you that, and it's funny because I, because Sax and I were talking yesterday, and he's probably watching, seeing this. Oh, my I man, Sax. Yeah. I said, you know, James could have like started in the Orange Bowl, and he would have said, "No, it's no big deal." What yeah. big thing? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about how did you start playing tuba? How did all that come up? Well, actually, I started playing instrumental music a lot later than most of my colleagues, me personally. But um, I started basically the end of my um, junior high school years going into the ninth grade. Um, growing up in the church, I was around music all the time. And so most of what I knew, most of what I knew was singing and decided I want to get, you know, be part of an organization. So I decided to join, you know, learn an instrument and join the band. And the truth of the matter is I started out on trumpet. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those situations where there were, you know, uh, plentiful trumpets in the band, but not many tubas. And so my band director switched me to the instrument and I immediately fell in love with the function of it. Uh, not so much the way it's at least not so much the way it sounded when I played because <laughs> I hadn't developed much of a sound yet. But, right. but at least w what we were supposed to be doing as far as laying down a bass line or laying down the foundation that I, I really related to right away. So I stayed with it. Yeah. And you met, you met Palafian at an early age, right? Yes. It, it turns out, I didn't, I didn't learn this until later high school, but um, it turns out that Sam Palafian's father was our family's lawyer. So Sam knew me since I was like two years old or something like that. And the two families were very close. 
but I did not know Sam as we were growing up, uh, as I was growing up. And it right. turns out I, as a high school student, I went to a master class at the University of Miami given by Sam. And man, he, he did things on the, on the instrument, not just technically, but musically things on the instrument that I, I it totally blew my mind. I went home to tell my dad, hey, I just heard this incredible world famous tuba player by the name of Sam Palafian. And my dad is like, wow, the same little Sammy plays the tuba too? is what he said. <laughs> then that's when I found out that there was a connection with the family. Little Sammy, wow. Yeah, so from that point on, we, you know, we've been pretty connected and, and good friends. Yeah, a great loss for all of us. Absolutely. The fact that he's not here anymore, yeah. Absolutely, but that's just crazy that that, that connection happened so early. Yeah. And then it wasn't until a little later where you realized Exactly, exactly. And it turns out, I mean, he studied with a, a person by the name of Constance Weldon, who I also studied with my first year or so at University of Miami. So Sam was one of her first students and I was her last student. That type of thing, her last full student, should I say. Yeah. Right, right, right. So who, who replaced her at Miami that you studied with? Was it John Stevens? Was that? John Stevens, yeah. So to be more accurate, when I got to the University of Miami, Connie was, she was a dean. So she had retired from teaching. And she came out of retirement and I was her only student until they hired John Stevens. And from that point, I started working with John, which was absolutely fa fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I, I learned a lot about playing the tuba and about um, just a basic technique of playing from Connie and I learned basically everything else from John about music and, and how it's put together and really, really developed a passion for it under his tutelage. I, I really did. If, if people don't realize, he's, he's quite a composer as well. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah he's a fantastic composer, and, which is one of the things that, just as a musician, some of the lessons that he taught me and, and Connie, but about music and and composing and arranging and learning how it all fits together, how all of the parts fit together so that you know what your voice does and what the function of your voice does. That's really held me in, in good, um, good standing to this point in my career, really yeah. has. Now, well, before you went to Miami, was there, was there like a moment where you were like, this is something I wanna do? Was there like a kind of a clear, moment where you knew you were going to go into music or? No, before I went to Miami, no, not really. Uh, to tell you the truth, as, as I mentioned, I grew up in uh, an area called Liberty City and mm -hmm. doing what I do now was not on the radar for any of us. So classical music playing in orchestras that I ha had no idea, had never really heard of a lot of the really, really fine orchestras. So going into Miami, I was one that said that you know, if you, if you would have asked me, I would have said, I don't like classical music, especially if it, you know, dealt with strings and that kind of thing, because I hadn't had any experience that way. Yeah. Mostly a little bit of jazz, popular R&B and gospel. That's what I really, really knew. Yeah. Um, but yeah, about my sophomore year, it was, it was listening for the first time to the first movement of Gustav Mahler's Third Symphony that was really eye-opening. I couldn't believe it's like, wow, they someone wrote that for orchestra and the sound of it. And shortly after that, the next thing was um, uh, Berlioz Symphonic uh, Symphony Fantastique. Yeah. And so after I heard those two pieces, then I'm in. I'm in. I don't know. <laughs> I don't you know if if if, if you all playing this kind of music, teach me how to do it because I'm in. That that's what happened with me. Now the ironic thing is, after as much personnel managing as you've done, you still like music with strings. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, <laughs> Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point, man. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah. remember, I remember playing Symphony Fantastic, Fantastic with you. For those of you who don't know, that James and I were colleagues in Jacksonville Symphony for a little while, and uh, I I had the pleasure of sitting in front of him and hearing this fantastic running commentary about everything that was happening, man. It was, <laughs> it was, it was the highlight of any rehearsal, man. It's just, like, look, you know, what was going to come out next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, That's funny. 
but so yeah so those two pieces and like who did you gravitate toward like listening wise or like conceptually as you were developing as a student ah okay so as a brass player and as you might imagine most of what everyone talked about was the sound and the way the brass section with the chicago symphony played mm -hmm. Right. So my colleagues, you, we'd sit around late at night and listen to Chicago sy Symphony recordings, and that was fantastic. So Arnold Jacobs was, was really prominent. Uh, to be honest with you, when I was in, uh, um, in undergraduate school, brass quintet playing was more, was more important to me, and learning about chamber music and learning about that nonverbal communication that right. happened. So a lot of empire, primarily empire. Yeah, but then I started listening to um, Cleveland Orchestra and Ron Bishop, and there was something about the way that that orchestra played and the combination of Ed Anderson and Ron Bishop that rang very true to to my ears, just the way that that it fit. So for a long time, that was that was my model. That's what I yeah what I heard and tried to get to as far as orchestral playing. Yeah. Well, that's a great model. I mean, those two guys were incredible together. Yeah, it was it, it, it was fan. It just it it sounded true to me. That's did, that's the best way that I can describe it. Did you ever did you ever take lessons with Ron or with Jacobs or anybody like that? Uh, yeah, no, I I had the opportunity to meet both of them, um, but never had the opportunity to take lessons. And that is something that that's one of the very very big regrets for me. Um, not having had a chance to spend time with Mr. Jacobs and talk about music, yeah. because when we met, we we talked about other things briefly, and with Mr. Bishop, I've had a chance to meet him on a couple of occasions, but at that point, um, I, I, he had retired from playing, and I, st I still should have and would have benefited greatly from him hearing me and, and giving me some guidance, but it just never quite materialized that way. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's hard to keep, it's hard to do it all, man. But it seems like it's yeah. <laughs> and then and then after uh, after Birmingham, well, actually before I, I go on with that, what was your like practice regimen like when you were an undergrad? You know, when you were you know especially when you were developing like your fundamentals and your basics. What would you say your day was like? My my actual practice day routine, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is for public con consumption. No, that's that, that's why. No, the truth of the matter is, I was involved in a variety of things at the at the University of Miami. So for me, my actual practicing didn't happen until late at night, when most of the other distractions had were done. So my basic routine is, I would get up fairly early in the morning and and warm up and do uh, a specific warm up that Connie Weldon had introduced me to and then as far as really practicing I didn't I didn't do that again until starting maybe 11 p.m. 11 to about 1 a.m. was that was my routine for a variety of reasons not least of which if I was out looking for social activity if I didn't find it by 11 p.m. it wasn't <laughs> I wasn't going to find it, so so I wasn't going to be distracted, you know, uh, and I and I was I was just more focused. So that was for the four years that I was there, that was my routine. Right. And and I generally practice outside. That was the other thing. So probably ninety five percent of the time that I played, it was somewhere outside, which you could do at at the University of Miami. The weather permitted it. Right. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, and then before. And then you won a job with uh, Birmingham, right? That's correct. Yeah, said. Alabama Symphony. Alabama Symphony. And was it Birmingham Symphony at that time, or was it Alabama? Was it? No, it was called the Alabama Symphony at that Alabama. time. Alabama. I can't remember if they changed that name or not back then. And then you were there for a number of years, right? Before I was there for 10, 10 years. And then they had a, a period of, of closure, right? Yes, that's exactly right. We... Um, filed chapter seven or chapter 11 and an organization went away for three years. And during that period of time, I ended up going down to Naples, Florida mm -hmm. and playing there, but also doing administrative work there for, for two or three seasons. Yeah. So you did do, you did do some, 
or playing as a student, right? When you were at Miami, but that must have been like a, a real different world to go from what had mostly been chamber music emphasis to playing in an orchestra like that. Yes, yeah, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the chamber music, but again, it, it has, has held me in very good stead, I, I think. So being in very much a chamber music emphasis type of environment um, and playing in the, the student orchestras at, at University of Miami, was, it was good. It was very formative, but it was very different when I walked on stage with the, the orchestra at the Alabama Symphony. And all of a sudden, these professional brass players that produce a, a very different sound than we students were doing that at the University of Miami, and um, and the repertoire and just a, sort of the work ethic and the preparation and that type of thing, because all of a sudden, every week there was major literature as opposed to you know playing pretty major things for my instrument maybe once or twice a semester. Right. So that was very much a shift, but the the principles that I learned from the um, chamber music environment really held me in good stead as far as as far as a nonverbal communication and really being aware, you know, very highly aware of what's going on around me. Right. Um, and I don't I find that that's one of the things that a lot of students that's a um that they're developing that those skills much later much right. later like well after they get on the job type type of thing before they start developing the radar as uh, one of my colleagues puts it yes yeah exactly that it's uh the orchestra becomes like a big quintet in a way you just have to listen a little further away right you right listen. yeah but when you when you look at it that way, then yeah, it's it's really, really, really rewarding. Um, I, I don't know, yeah, it's it's really rewarding. And so, being learning that chamber music environment, and then transferring it to yeah, the orchestra is a big quintet. It's just that the the violin's a lot farther away, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. But, and yes. that can be good and bad. You say that can be good and bad. That can be good and bad, right? I mean, oh. <laughs> kind of <a> situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but to be to be more for me personally, there you know there are certain instruments that I tend to lock into the the principal trumpet, um, you know, because they're set in the style for what the brass section plays. So if they're playing with a clear musical voice, then it helps me, and then I know what what my objective is. So I'm listening to principal trumpet. I listen to the timpani very closely for a lot of different reasons, you know, right. pitch, rhythm, that kind of thing, to make sure we lays a lot. The bass is naturally the bass trombone. You can't help but hear him for me because he's sitting right next to me. Right. But I, I, I look, I, I um, seek out certain things. Bassoons, I, I make, I make an, uh, a strong effort to hear what they're doing, and so that, and and it's just it's sort of natural for me to, now it's natural for me to do that. And it's much more enjoyable when, when I'm able to. Do you remember, yeah, well, do you remember what the uh, the first thing you played with Birmingham, with Alabama was? Oh, the first piece. Or, or Actually, like the I think, piece, yeah, yeah I, I think it was the Fountains of Rome. I think it was the Fountains of Rome. I remember it was on that season. Um, wow, that season, that was quite a few things, but I think the very first piece that I actually played was the Fountains of Rome. And it went by so fast is what I recall that I, yeah. I think I, as I recall, I think I got most of it on the first read through, but by the before, it just, I was nervous and people playing with such a big sound. And I was, you know, I would say in awe, but a little bit in, in awe and swimming, but I think it was the Fountains of Rome. That year, we played pictures quite often. Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. I remember the first year we played pictures at an exhibition. We played it at youth concerts. We played it on tour. So I got to know that piece very, very well. <laughs> Did you play Beadlow on tuba? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, okay. Yeah, I played it on F tuba. 
Oh, Naftuba. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to bring up something about that in, in a little bit. What's, um, and then after you were in Naples for a little bit, then you won the job in Jacksonville after yes. that. Yes. And you've been there since 1995, I believe. That's right. That sounds right. Yes, right. 1995, yes. <laughs> and and uh, what what changes would you say you've noticed? I mean, you've been doing this a while now. What, what do you notice in auditions as time has gone on? Like, are there any tendencies? Are people playing louder or softer or cleaner or any different than you say they would have 20 years ago, 25 years ago? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. So I will say from um, more from a personnel perspective, meaning that I not only get to hear brass players, but I've heard, you know, as I'm proctoring auditions, I'm hearing all type, you know, wind, strings, percussion, what have you. Uh, that's a very, very good question. People are tending to play, I would say, stronger, more extroverted. A little louder is a thing that I have noticed, at least in the orchestras and the and the um, the auditions that I've been involved in. Um, yeah. But that has not necessarily always been been a positive thing for them. Right. So, so what I've noticed, especially in Jacksonville, let's say if the candidates that we have to come to play an audition, I'm going to say hypothetically a horn audition, okay. maybe 70% of them might play stronger volume wise than say, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but that 70% of them don't necessarily advance. Um, the, the persons that tend to advance, that um, those things ha have been pretty consistent. So people that come in and play very well in tune and very well rhythmically precise and with yeah. integrity and those, those standards stay the same, but I would say the overall thing has been play as strong. And I, I say the same thing with woodwind and, and strings. I mean, people seem to be playing stronger. Yeah. Um, but I, that's not always necessarily the ticket to success in the, in the venues that I've been a part of. Right. Right. What, and, uh, and outside of the orchestra, what other kind of music, I mean, you do some chamber music of various types, right? I mean, I know you, we did some quintets up there, like what seems to be a million years ago. <laughs> no, I was, I was far back. <laughs> what, yeah. what about, uh, so what, what, what other activities are you involved in musically outside of work? Then? As far as performing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm always, well, the two answers to that question. I'm always looking for creative ways and creative ensembles to get involved with that aren't necessary. Well, I guess you can call them chamber music. I've uh, created a couple of groups here. We always use the same name. We call it symbiosis. And it's usually something like tuba percussion where the percussion would be hand drums, djembes and doombecks and congas and that kind of thing. And then some type of harmony instrument, either guitar or we did a couple of uh, performances recently where the, the harmony instrument was marimba or, or um, vibraphone or tuba and harp and percussion or tuba harp voice and not necessarily playing classical music. So we have a wide variety of things. And I do this because it, it forces me to change the way that I hear things and be more flexible with the, with my voice on the tuba because, um, yeah, I, I can't play with a harp the same way that I can play in brass quintet. It doesn't work. Okay. So um, that's something that's always very interesting to me. And I've been I've been very lucky and very fortunate to to have the opportunity to play solo repertoire in in various capacities. Usually over in Europe, you know, I have to leave the country for anybody to want me to hear to play <laughs> hear hear me play solo. But usually over in Europe. But that, that's been a lot of fun and have had a couple of pieces created for, for us. And yeah, that's always, that's always a lot of fun. Oh man, that's, that's terrific. And speaking of these different sizes of instruments and kind of going back to the student thing,
backtracking a little bit. Were you playing B flat tuba as a student and then switched to C at some point, or or when? Oh, how did that happen? Yes, all right. we all start on B flat. M most tuba players start on B flat. Some start on on um, instrument pitch in E flat, but right. most start on B flat. And at some point, usually later high school or early college uh, in this country, uh, we we switch to C tuba yeah. because that is the standard instrument for professionals in this country. Uh, but it just so happens that I was one that did not switch. Uh, and it wasn't anything, people think that it was because of some philosophy that I had about, you know, the B flat tuba fits better in the orchestra. It, that has nothing to do with it. Literally, um, as I was going through college and working with Connie Weldon and John Stevens and Abe Torchinsky, each one of them told me that, you know, James, at some point, you're gonna have to switch to C tuba. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. You tell me what to do. But all of them said, but yeah, you, you're playing B flat real well. Let's, let's wait to switch un, until you actually need to. And uh, as it turns out, I won the position in Alabama the beginning of my senior year in college. So now all of a sudden I'm in a position that I'm not going to switch because <laughs> Right away, I'm playing F Fountains of Rome or in, you know, Mahler One and all of this literature. And yeah, I was, I was going to be holding on tight. So I just didn't switch. So it, there wasn't any magical philosophy, you know, basically. And, and what I found is most of my colleagues don't really know whether I'm playing B flat or C. It, it, it's, it's, if I'm playing in tune, <laughs> it's, it's cool. Or yeah, you know, yeah. if I'm playing in time, it's 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 cool. Yeah. So you're still playing B flat tuba now. I still play B flat tuba now. Always have. Wow. Now I switch my my students to C if they if they express an interest in becoming a professional player here in this country, then I encourage them to to switch primarily because that is the market that is a professional market here in this country. So if they want to have access to all of the, the finest instruments, uh, you know, the PT6s and the, just a variety of instruments here, they need to be in that environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I still play B-flat. You still play B-flat. But in, in a quintet, right, you're going to play some f tube, I would imagine. Yes. You go back and forth a little bit. Yes, a little bit. Or I play a smaller B-flat is what, what yeah. tends to happen. So I do go, go back and forth. What did you, what's your uh, setup on the B flat tuba now? What brand are you playing? Uh, my main instrument is uh, 1925 York. So it's a, it's a York, uh, original York B flat, uh, six quarter. Yeah, a beautiful instrument. Not easy to play, you yeah. know, <laughs> not easy to manage, but that's my main instrument um, these days especially since I do most of my playing in orchestra. Right, right. Yes. Now that's, uh, would that be the similar vintage that Jacobs had? Yes, he played yes. York as well, right? Yes, exactly right. Exactly okay. right. And so, yeah, the, the wonderful, wonderful instruments. The Chicago York is like one of the really model instruments for, for tuba. And so it is, it is basically the same vintage. I think that it plays a little different than that 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 instrument the player right. certainly plays differently you know <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not as well but you know but yeah that's that's my main instrument yeah. okay okay and what kind of things do you switch to like an f4 in the orchestra almost anything uh that's burials yeah for sure yeah and uh, more recently and it's more recently i've been doing anything that's written for bass tuba as opposed to contra bass tuba and my good friend uh yasu the, the principal tubist in uh, cleveland yeah. is the one that really brought that to my attention i would have an opportunity to play extra with him and i would notice that he plays f on a number of things that i never really considered and so we have a conversation about it so now I try F tuba on Brahms second as an example. So many Brahms things, anything that's Berlioz, uh, some Wagner things, 
So okay. if it says base tuba, now all of a sudden I I look at it with a different through a different prism, and I make a decision which do I think will fit better. Not that's easier to play, but which fits better fits the, fits the timbre of what the low brass is going to to be doing, and I make my decisions based on that. No, oh, excellent. Yeah, it's uh, similar to trumpet sometimes. You know? Yeah, very 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 similar. Very similar. But a lot of times we go because it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, man. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So you teach at University of North Florida. So we'll talk about some of your students a little bit. Um, what, uh, what, what changes have you noticed with students coming in now? Because that's uh, probably even more different, I would imagine, than, than the auditions. For me, um, some of my, I, I've been very, very, very fortunate to have worked with some really outstanding students earlier in my career. Uh, Mike Roylance is one that comes to mind. Uh, Demadre Thurman is one, J.T. Clark. Really, really, and one of the things, in addition to work ethic, that all of them shared was a, a, a real curiosity, a, a real thirst for wanting to know not just taking the instruction, but wanting to know why or wanting to know two or three or four ways to approach something, but being very, very curious uh, about whatever it is that, that we were talking about. Um, and I don't see that quite as much with students that I work with now. They, there seems to be a little bit more of a thought that whatever they receive in the hour that we're in a private lesson is either is enough or that's all that there is and the truth of the matter is there's not but so much information you can you can um that you can offer in an hour and as a good friend of mine tim adams says you offer the information that you that you have and then they need to do a certain amount of work before they can unlock the next level of questions to bring to you. And the one thing that I've observed, at least with the students that I work with, that generally you don't see the same level of curiosity. And maybe it's, maybe it's because DeMarjorie and Mike and all of them went back and did the work and then came back with very in-depth pointed questions. And then you can get to a little bit uh, deeper level. But that's, I would say, for me, that was one of the differences. Yeah. Do you think part of that's because of the, uh, the differences in listening? I mean, you described when you were in school, like staying up late, a lot of group listening. I feel like there's less of that now than, than maybe there was before, just because the technology's changed some things. So that's interesting that you say that, Mark. Yeah, I, I, I have observed that also. Mostly... <laughs> It always surprises me when I talk to students, my students or other students at University of Florida, University of North Florida, what have you, and I ask, hey man, have you all heard this? Or have you checked out this piece on recording? And it, it will be things that they're working on. You know, maybe things that their orchestra is playing. And the idea of having listened to it in, in any way other than them, what they do in rehearsal, hasn't occurred to them. And that's the opposite of what we did coming up. It really is the opposite. And for a variety of reasons, people wanted to listen to music. I mean, that's, a, that's our language. And so the way that we learn our language and the way that we understand Bud Herseth and Bernie Adelstein and Gil Johnson, and Mr. Johnson was, was there on campus with us, but yeah we go and we, we listen to the work that they did and all of a sudden that also formulated questions. Man, how did he do that? And wow, it sounded like he did that all in one breath. Oh, that's impossible. You know, how did he come up with that phrasing? We, we had never thought of that, that type of thing. But um, I, it always surprises me a little bit when I ask a question, hey, hey, have you all checked that out on recording? What do you think about it? And they had, hadn't considered doing it. Wow. You know, so. Wow. Now, speaking of that, I mean, kind of going back to the reference you just made, did, 
you know, you had Mr. Johnson, you had Mr. Torchinsky walking around school. I mean, you were exposed to these guys and able to ask a lot of questions probably firsthand. How much, how much interaction did you have with like Gil Johnson, even though he was the trumpet teacher? Would Quite you... a bit. Um, because he was one of the coaches of the brass quintet that I played in, in school. I, I was fortunate enough to play with a really, really fine student group that um, encompasses uh, Carl Albach was one of our trumpet players, uh, Scott Thornburg was a trumpet player, Richard Dean, who plays in the New York Philharmonic now, was our horn player, a very fine trombonist, Albert Perez, who's no longer in the music side of business, but very fine, and myself. And uh, Mr. Johnson was one of our coaches, so got to spend a fair amount of time with him and learned a lot about, again, a lot about music. He was very direct. <laughs> he was very direct, but it, it was great. I remember one of the one of our very first coaching sessions. We were playing some music. Uh, it was Baroque music. I can't remember something, maybe a sight piece or something. We played through it, I, and I'm personally thinking that I did pretty well. He made a few comments in the to the trumpet players, to Scott and Carl. Then he said, "James, you sounded good. Play everything half the dynamic that you just played." straight across the board, half dynamic. So then I immediately think, oh, Mr. Johnson doesn't like the tuba, you know. But then he later explained that, that the sound of the music at that time did not have a bass instrument as big as what I was playing. And it would change the color of the, you know, of what they're presenting right now. So I did, I cut my dynamic in half and the, the, the sound of the piece totally the, the sound the color all of a sudden it, it sparkled then i thought you know even before then i had a lot of respect for him but then i thought wow there's a lot that i can learn there's a lot for me to learn there's a lot that i can learn let me be quiet and listen to every word he says and every word john stevens says and the people that coach us ray mace was another coach that we had which, yeah in Miami. Fantastic. fantastic yeah i didn't know that, that mace was in coaching you guys in Miami? Yeah, it wasn't at Miami. It was at the um, Aspen Music Festival. Oh, right. right yeah, right, right. We, we were the first, that student group was the first group that uh, they that Aspen brought in under a fellowship as a pre-existing brass quintet. And that's where I met my good friend, Michael Sachs. That's right. So yeah, he played with, he played with the group. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic, really fantastic. And so uh, the American Brass Quintet at that time, would that have been Mason Gecker? Mason Gecker, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, wow. and Wakefield and <laughs> yeah, Bob yeah, Biddlecombe and Ron Bohr. Yeah. Man, that's a great players, man. And that's yeah, yeah, really fantastic. Nice so I'm sure you don't have any stories about that that we can share publicly yeah. right now. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. So, and you were, and because you're around Mr. Torchansky and Mr. Johnson, did they ever talk about the Gabrielli album? Was that ever a topic? Oh, so not with Mr. Mr. Torchinsky, Mr. T, but at Miami with Mr. Johnson, that was a bit of a topic, mainly because the other trumpet players would, you know, Scott and Carl, and well, we would bring it, we would bring it up. Right. And um, aside, the thing that I remember the most about what he said about playing the Gabriel Gabrielli album was the feeling of um, uh, I'm, my word was is euphoria that he had playing with the colleagues from these other orchestras from Cleveland and Chicago yeah. that you know that it was they were at the top of the mountain that he was at the top of the mountain playing with them that's what I really gathered I don't remember us talking a lot about specifics yeah. You know, and why did, you know, did you play this part on that? I don't recall those kinds of conversations, just generally. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's legendary. That's yeah. absolutely legendary. That's such a, yeah, it's such a landmark recording. And, and of course, the new one that, that was made a couple of years ago. I was going to, yep, I was going to reference that. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Amazing playing, amazing music, amazing arrangements. Yeah. 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 Either one of those recordings, if if I'm playing really bad, that's usually the first thing I go to to kind of wash away the dust of whatever my students have done to me that week. <laughs> I 
understand that, man. <laughs> no offense if any of my students are watching this. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it really is inspirational for me to, to hear it, to hear brass playing in general on that level and hearing how they all came together as an ensemble. You know, it really is. It's, it's just, it's, it's inspirational. That's, that's the best way for me to articulate it. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, as soon as you as soon as you brought up uh, those two gentlemen, I wanted to make sure I asked that question because because yeah. there's and you know there's not too many of those guys left anymore that were on that album. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I had not really thought about that, but yeah, that's true. I think when I look at that recording, I think Jay Friedman obviously still around. I don't know. Is Missile Edelstein still? I I don't know. No. Oh no. Yeah, he was here in Florida, over on the west coast of Florida, yeah, for a while. But I, I did not. Oh, yeah, not, not, not many, as you see. Yeah, yeah. I have a uh, LP signed by he and Jacobs both. Oh, Edelstein. really? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I asked uh, Edelstein once. I said, Mr. Edelstein, who were some of your favorite conductors to play for? And he, because he had this wall in his house in Sarasota of uh, all these black and white signatures signed to him. You know, like. Copeland, Stravinsky, Reiner. Oh, wow. It was amazing, right? And he just looked at me and said, the dead ones. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's, oh, that's good. And, See, that sounds like something Mr. Johnson would say. Yeah. <laughs> and, when I, and when I got the job in Jacksonville and I called him to tell him I got this job, I said, oh, and I'm sure this person's not watching, but I said, oh, they got this new conductor. Everybody's real excited. And his comment was, give it time. <laughs> that's funny that's funny no. uh, words of words of wisdom man yeah, <laughs> wow <true. laughs> yeah that's so great. so what so do you ever have students who have switched or, or maybe maybe high school students or something that are switching to the tuba from something like say euphonium or baritone instrument what kind of what kind of things do you see with students like that? That yeah, I have students that switch from euphonium to tuba, and also from other instruments like bass to tuba. But I'll speak more from euphonium to tuba. Um, actually, the switches have been generally pretty successful, except for for the things that you might imagine. Um, they tend to play fairly well in the middle and middle upper register with a pretty clean, clear sound. And I attribute that to the fact that that's, that's a register that they are accustomed to not only playing, but also hearing. Right. And so developing, developing some clarity and a certain kind of sound in the middle to low register is always a, a little bit of a focus. Yeah. Um, also, just developing a little bit of flexibility in that same register, not sound, but not only sound, but flexibility in the middle to low register is one of the things that we, with me, that we immediately start to, to uh, concentrate on. And as soon as they are able to, to develop that a little bit, then all of a sudden they have a pretty wide range you know, even more so than, than uh, a lot of the students that come to me that haven't played any other instrument. So that's, that's the, primary, the primary thing. But it's, it's been, most of the students have done it very successfully. Yeah. Is, is there any, um, uh, yeah, like you were talking, what, what kind of like routine do you prescribe the students as far as their fundamentals? Or do you have a routine that you do that is fairly consistent? <laughs> I have a routine that I do that we call chop busters and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty taxing. And I, I do it. It covers some real basic things with it playing and, and producing a sound buzzing, you know, mouthpiece buzzing, free buzzing, that kind of thing. But then it starts to stretch out pretty quickly into I won't say extended techniques, but extended, but techniques and extended registers and that type of thing. I don't require my students, I introduce my students to it, but I don't require them to, to do that. The things that I, I really um, 
preach for lack of a better term is work in Arvins, mm -hmm. any type of work in, in Arvins, specifically uh, the complete trombone method. And for tuba, we just read it down the octave. But there's some new Arvins editions out um, that are fantastic. Mike Roy Lance has one, Wesley Jacobs has a, has a, a, a good edition. Anything that's Arvins and Bordoni are the things. So for basic development, warm up, routine, all of those things, those two books encompass a lot of what I, I share with my students. Okay. And, and then we go from there. You know, there's some other books that, that tuba players use. But specifically, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of the real basic technique that you develop as you go through the Arvin's book. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, I also want to ask you about, uh, about another thing, which is body and soul. Mm. It's kind of an outside of the strictly performance area. But tell, tell everybody a little bit about what that, what that is and how that came to be. Okay, well, it's a nonprofit organization that we run here in Jacksonville. Um, and the purpose of the organization is to form a collaboration between the arts community and the healthcare community. So uh, we do a little over a thousand events a year. So it's pretty busy. And we do everything from helping with medical research. Um, and, and everything that we do is live, it's live music. But helping with medical research to um, helping raise awareness of, of certain kind of medical issues by having large events. So a, an example would be bringing in Wynton Marsalis and Marcus Roberts to do an event or the Count Basie Orchestra to do a, a, a prostate cancer awareness event. From those types of things to having musicians go and play bedside, we call it room service, but actually play for patients in nursing homes and hospitals. And, and we've, the organization, we've run it for 20 years that we've done it. And uh, it's been very, very interesting in a way that none of us had anticipated. Um, it's been very rewarding in a way that none of us has, had anticipated. And you learn a lot about the power of music and the power of what we do and the power of what we have um, the privilege to have access to. It's really, really strong. Um, the reason that we developed it, my father spent the last, I don't know, seven years of his life in various healthcare facilities because of uh, complications from diabetes. And um, I noticed the impact on not only he, he or him, but other patients when he would ask me to come in and bring my instrument and play for him. And, you know, naturally, usually I was pretty embarrassed to, you know, do it, but he was my dad and he asked me to come and play. Well, I have to bring out the lug the two way and the play. But I, I noticed the impact on him and others. So then I started studying a little bit about music therapy and various music therapy programs, you know, around the country. So ah, we want to try to offer something a little bit different than the therapy. So the idea behind our organization is those of us that make a living in the arts, we, it's a community service and it's an outreach. And we just do it through the healthcare community because um, that community blurs all of the demographic boundaries. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So all of us are impacted one way or another by the healthcare environment. So yeah, we've been doing it, as I say, for 20 years and it's been really, really unbelievably rewarding. Now, is it still in Jacksonville or is it, has it branched out further than that? It, it is primarily in Jacksonville. We've been approached about branching out from about nine different cities around the country. It, in my thing, especially during the time that people were reaching out to us was, man, I'm barely able to hang on here in Jacksonville with what I did teaching and with the orchestra. So we didn't branch out. Now this type of work is becoming more part of the um, part of the culture for the arts. And so you're starting to see other organizations do something similar. But we were, we were the first organization in this country that was organized specifically the way that we were and did what did the work, the specific work that we that we do. And if anybody wants to learn more about that is the website body and soul dot is is body and soul jacks b o d y a n d soul jacks dot com. Okay. 
yeah, we need to we need to update the website, but yeah, that that will be a place to go and get some information. Well, I would imagine right now with everything going on, that that's well, I don't know. It's such a contagious situation we have right now, but yes, yeah, I, I'm in quarantine as we speak. <laughs> yeah, you were just we mentioned, mentioned that. Yeah, I, I uh, found myself having significant uh, contact with uh, with a family that just recently tested positive. So I've been banished to my to my room, you know, and we went and took our retook our test today, and so hopefully everything is okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's a tricky tricky time. And yeah. by the way, there's some people saying hello to you. Uh, oh, Holly Pritchard. Oh, Holly, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gail Williams. Oh, Gail That's Williams. Right. Gail Williams. Wow, says hi. wonderful. Brian French. Yes. <laughs> uh, our friend Hugo from the Met. You know. Who yes. Wow. And uh, and our old colleague Amy Zalota. Amy, yeah, yeah, we, we've been in contact some. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, really yeah. fantastic. She, she's done okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. fantastic. So, um, yeah, man, there's a couple people I'm sure that want to ask some questions. So I'm just gonna kind of like let some let some folks in here and okay. uh, make sure I don't screw any of this up because that's a strong possibility. <laughs> um, I'm asking people to start video. We'll see. Some people are so smooth about this and <laughs> I am not. So. Oh. Hey, there's okay. Joyce Davis. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> right. How are you? Please, Art. Oh, I'm doing great. Oh, it's fantastic to see you. I'm moving back to Florida. Really? Yep. Where and when? Uh, back to Gainesville and yeah. um, at the end of August, beginning of September. Ah. Shelvin, Shelvin's coming up to help drive me down. Ah, Shelvin, my man Shelvin. Ah, yeah. fantastic. Are you still playing at Bresselmeyer or not? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Oh, Carl yeah, and I that... are very close friends. Oh, really? Yeah, I... yeah. He... I changed over to one of his, but I don't yeah. play much anymore. Oh, yeah, it's a fantastic product, and yeah, he, he's he's also a fantastic guy. Oh yeah, he's oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah it really is. It really is. Yeah, that that's the mouthpiece that I play on my big instrument. That's my main mouthpiece uh -huh. on my large instrument these days. I, well, I saw some pictures of you on his website. I mean, oh. on the Facebook okay. page. I don't remember if it's the Bresselmeyer one or Carl's, you know, okay. own one, but. Okay, yeah. I wow. said, be James Jenkins. Really, right? <laughs> I was going to say, if you saw a picture of me, I, I'm sorry about that. I, I, I should apologize. <laughs> uh, get out of here. <laughs> we'll, oh, we'll, a... we'll get in touch when I'm down. Yeah, please do. Please yeah. do. That would be great. That would be great, Joyce. Okay. Good to see you, Joyce. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Yeah, great to see you. <laughs> So, uh, hold on one second here. So, uh, James, you were talking a little bit, a little while ago about, um, hang on, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. One second here. And you so far ahead of me, that's, yeah. I don't know about that, man. I don't <laughs> know about that. Joyce, there we go, I got you now. So, tell me a little bit more about when you were at Aspen, because you, you were at Aspen with Sax. Who else would have been there? Eric Rusk, is that right? I. Rusk may have been there. I, I got to know Rusk a little bit later. I mean, I really got to know him a little bit later. So I don't know that I, I didn't cross paths with him then. I was roommate slash suite mates with Edgar Meyer, mm -hmm. you know, the, the base, the bases. Yes. Which yeah, he, he was he was, you know, mind blowing even back then. Right. Um, but mostly we we didn't play a lot within the festival. We came in as as the preformed brass quintet. And so they had us playing concerts all over the Aspen area, going to Vail and Crescent Butte and that type of thing. So as far as getting to know a lot of the other brass players there, uh, Richard Watson was the other one of the other tuba players there um, playing what was the festival orchestra. But yeah. Sachs made the biggest impression for a lot of different reasons, not least of which he, he played with a, our group. And right. yeah, he is absolutely fantastic as you as you would imagine. Yeah, you know, right. then. So 
Yeah, I was just I was just thinking about like the collection of people you mentioned, both in the brass quintet at Miami, and then the people you were around at Aspen. You Man, know. I, yeah, I was really fortunate, really, really fortunate. I, I I have to say, I have been fortunate through you know with the colleagues that I've had a chance to work with, and colleagues like Dr. Davis that I've had a chance to teach with, and you know, you mentioned Gail Williams and Amy Zoloto, and yeah, it's really, really, I've been lucky. I, I, I've been lucky, I, I have to say. Well, I think, I think I would say, just like any of those people that have played with you, we've been lucky to be ah. around you. Man. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a great inner that you've always brought, you know, no matter what, you know, you can make the darkest day quite a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mark. So, <laughs> thanks, man. But, uh, Hey man, you know, before we close up, do you have any, anything else you want to talk about or anything that comes to mind or, or that you, you know, during this time of quarantine, I mean, are you practicing a lot? Are you staying in shape? I mean, how are you? I, I'm practicing, I'm practicing some. I mean, I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, house projects and Rick Stout has, you know, been trying to encourage me to work on my golf swing. I don't really have a golf swing, so he's been, you know, uh, but Rick has a good actually, golf swing. What's that now? Rick has a good golf swing. <laughs> yeah, he his looks good. I don't have one. So, you know, and I promised that the next time I, I promised him the next time that I saw him, I would go out golfing with him. So but I've been been working on various video projects, mostly with the organization with body and soul and, and doing some virtual things. And uh, that has been it primarily through the through this quarantine period. Um yeah was hoping to get a chance to play in person with some colleagues this summer. But as you know, none of us, I mean, all of us are ha having to put that on the back burner. Right, right, right. right now, so, but, well, um, you, and you've probably been teaching some through Zoom, I would imagine as well with some students. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anything like, so, I mean, I'm always looking for tips with that. I'm sure that people are too. Like anything you've noticed works well or maybe not as well with, what we're having to deal with with the virtual teaching? Wow. Um, to be honest with you, I have been been going to and talk, talking to my friends like the Marjorie and Mike Roylance, asking them those same questions because I'm about two steps behind with regards to you know working the technology and, and that that type of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think what we I think what we've done has been has been good and effective primarily from a concentration standpoint but there isn't so it, it has been good for the students and for me um because we seem to really get focused for that that period of time even even more so than sometimes in the studio um you know when people are walking by and there are various types of distractions that has been good but I, I am still trying to learn. I'm still trying to find the magic words and the magic, you know, the magic thing to make the, the Skype and the Zoom work as well as some of my other colleagues. It, it is difficult because there's so many things that they just kind of will pick up on inherently by being in a room with you or that you don't have to say. Yes. Right. And then yeah. on the Zoom, it's like you have to watch everything. The, the, the thing, the, the other funny thing is funny for me is I guess with Zoom or Skype, things change with the time, or there's a lag sometimes that then it speeds up and the video catches up. So I'm not sure exactly what it what it is, but it makes my student it makes me it makes my students sound like they're playing horribly out of time. And so you know I, I'll rag on them a little bit about that, and they will say, "Prop, that's not me. It's the video." And I'm not sure I'm not sure who it is, you know, but. Uh, you but aside I, from, I was gonna say sometimes it's like watching somebody play bagpipes. You know, like they oh. breathe in and then the right. sound comes on like five <laughs> seconds later. Or there, there's a video of them holding a trumpet and then they stop playing. You know, and then you hear the sound. <laughs> yeah, kind of disconcerting that way. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's been enjoyable. But I had I haven't found I haven't found the magic, you know, the magic no. word or the magic button yet. But we're working on it. I don't know if there's any magic with Zoom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm glad it's here, but I don't know great. if there's magic with it. But uh, hey, James, man, I it's awesome to see you, and uh, it's great to talk to you as always. And I hope I get to see you in person at some point, rather than looking so, forward to it, man. Yeah, looking man. forward to it. Dude, thanks so much. I hope you're healthy, and 
and be well. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you Thanks, Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Right. Have a good evening, man. Bye-bye.